Hi, everyone. Welcome to Farsight's Biotech and Health Extension seminar series sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. Very excited to have Yuri here, finally. And not for the first time giving a Farsight presentation, but we're really, really excited to have you on again, uh, this time to discuss epigenetic rejuvenation by in vivo partial reprogramming, past, present, and future. Very excited about what the future has to hold, but also excited Excuse to do it more about the past. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. I'll be in the chat. I'll be answering questions and then we'll be hitting the Q&A as soon as we can. So thanks a lot for joining, Yuri. You're a fantastic presenter and we're really delighted to have you. Thanks. Wow. Thank you for the kind words. I guess I'll just start sharing the slides. And yeah, in the interest of time, because I think I might go a little longer than the allotted half an hour. Generally plan like 40 minutes and then hopefully we'll have Q&A afterwards. Yeah, let's just jump in into the partial reprogramming, deep dive, what the future holds. I'm, yeah, also very excited to learn about that. Yes, the solidifications just are a little distracting, but I'm sure you can, you can handle them. All right. So yeah, um, let's jump right in. Oh, and before that, just wanted to mention that tonight is Yuri's Night. Yuri Gagarin is the first human in space who on this day in 1961, yeah, was the first in space. And also 20 years later, as this kind of emblem shows, just 20 years later, the first shuttle flight took place by Shuttle Columbia. And uh, yeah, fast forward 40 years and we're, we're still kind of haven't progressed too much. Definitely not as much as the, the jump to, between the first human in space in 61 and like the first shuttle in 81 so hopefully hopefully our field won't be as static as, as space exploration but uh, yeah anyway back to the topic of reprogramming let's let's go in of course the first problem we have to make sure that we clear that we're solving is the aging problem and uh, yeah we're, we're trying to slow it down we're trying to find ways to stop it or ideally even reverse it and uh, oops yeah, the modifications Keep popping up. Um, so one potential way to reverse it and, and do all the all of the above is cellular reprogramming. As on the cellular repro level, reprogramming can do all of those things as this diagram shows. It can reverse all hallmark hallmarks of aging and can rejuvenate cells both epigenetically and physiologically. And so the, the next big challenge for the field is to translate this from the cellular level to the organismal level. So can we harness the power of reprogramming for adult animals and not just cells in the petri dish. And personally, I've been trying to translate this paradigm since 2007, 2017, which is when I founded the first ever partial reprogramming company called Ethereum Genetics. And thankfully, the field has grown since then because initially investors thought I was just crazy. But now there's a dozen companies in the space and they're led by visionary investors like Sam Altman, Jeff Bezos, Yuri Milner, and others. Another Yuri, by the way. <laughs> All right, before we dive too deep into the details about partial reprogramming, let's take a step back and take a closer look at the problem that we're solving, the, the aging problem. And surprisingly, there's actually no 100% consensus about the definition of aging in the field at the moment. I'm sure most of the foresight is in the community because we had a well, workshop on that last year. And I, I see Padim uh, in, in the room, I'm sure she, she would agree. But uh, let me just share some observations about aging that. So I think give us a decent idea on what it is. And I mean, ironically, we all know when we see it, right? Because we can very well tell apart an old person from a young person. But I mean, and, and clearly aging is associated with a gradual decline in the organism's ability to maintain homeostasis, as it is also associated with these hallmarks of aging, the gospel of our field listed here. And the biggest problem posed by aging is that it kills us. And moreover, the risk of it killing us grows exponentially. And this is a logarithmic projection of the graph. And starting from about age 10, the risk doubles every eight years. And so for a 20-year-old, the risk of dying within the year is about one in a thousand. But for a 60-year-old, it's one in 100. And for an 80-year-old, it's, it's one in 10. So this exponential decline is very unsettling. And before killing us, aging makes us suffer, employing a wide arsenal of unpleasant diseases. There's hundreds of different flavors of age-related diseases, all of which grow exponentially with age, the risk of which grows exponentially with age. 
And the two biggest killers, I'm sure, heart disease and cancer, are by far the biggest reasons we die, with a few others equally bad ways like dementia following in their footsteps. And finally, the second biggest problem with aging, besides it's actually killing us, is that it starts so early. We barely get to enjoy our fully grown bodies before they start disintegrating. And the pace of that decline is very quick, unfortunately. And so I'm sure you agree that aging is a problem worth solving. So the next logical question is, why does that problem happen at all? And as I mentioned, there's no consensus even about what aging is. So obviously there's no consensus about what causes it. And there are many theories that form on a somewhat continuous spectrum between the two poles, on one end saying aging is programmed, and on the other saying aging is totally random with some in-between hypotheses. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, our opinions about what causes aging are important because we have empirical observations from many different species based on which we can then form our hypotheses. And so let me share some of these key observations. And the first observation is that aging is not universal and that speeds of aging and consequently lifespans, they vary tremendously. And some species live for just a few days and others live for centuries. And even within mammals, we have two orders of magnitude of variation where mice live for just two years and whale live for 200 years. And the huge variance in lifespans and speed of aging is observed even in very closely related species than the bale and the mouse. For example, even within the rock species genus, there's a 20 times difference in observed lifespans. And it's not just two different species with extreme lifespans, it's actually quite a smooth continuum between 50 different species. And so this alone tells us aging is quite malleable and well within the power of evolution to extend it by a factor of 100 or even more. And like I mentioned, not only aging is not universal, its patterns are quite variable, which means to me at least that there's no single physical law, second law of thermodynamics. No, it's not about entropy that causes aging. So there's something like it, it, in very, in different species, it, it has exhibiting different patterns. And so it's, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that on a species level, it's the genome that encodes that particular aging pattern for, for a given species, or typical life history for that species, including how long it lives. And of course, there's some variations between individuals. And I mean, even in some species, the aging speed can be different based on environmental factors. If there's a famine or a drought, some species can slow down their aging or can pause their development but it's all within the confines of their genome that they're allowed to explore that variation in lifespan. And the good news about that is that genetically prolonging a lifespan might not require massive genetic manipulation. As these two experiments show, in mice, they've been able to almost double lifespan by changing a single gene. In, in nematodes, the record is 10 times increasing lifespan by genetic manipulation. And also it turns out that even blind mutations coupled with artificial selection can pretty quickly result in increased lifespans. As Michael Rose has shown in his work, within just a few years, he was able to increase a lifespan in flies by up to 30%. And so, I mean, evolutionarily speaking, this is a blink of an eye on like time scales that evolution usually operates on. And I mean, so aging is obviously under genetic control. The, the next question, is it under epigenetic control? And so the next few observations I'd like to show is that possibly it could be also within epigenetic control. And, and for our purposes, I mean, I think this is an important implication because most of us, I'm sure, would prefer to extend our own lifespans rather than die with a happy thought that eventually evolution might find ways to extend human lifespans sometime in the future. But before I go into the observations in support of epigenetic control listed here on this slide, let me just say a few words about what epigenetics is. I'm sure most of it, but broadly speaking, epigenetics just means control of gene expression. And there's a few different mechanisms that are in charge of making sure which genes are on and which genes are off in any given cell. And in a multicellular organism like ourselves, this is a necessity because different cell types need very different genes to be on and off. And also besides just on and off, there's sort of like volume knobs that epigenetics controls, meaning the, how much of a given gene is expressed. And over time with aging, it seems that some good genes are turned down and some bad genes, the, the volume setting goes up. 
And finally, in parallel, for about a decade now, we've been aware of these epigenetic clocks that seem to tick in every cell, and they quite accurately predict the age of the person or the animal and from which those cells come from. Yeah. Now, well, let me share just a few more observations from nature, which show that aging and lifespan could be also under epigenetic control. And the most clear examples of this come from social animals, where individuals sharing identical DNA can have extremely different lifespans, depending on which social role they end up having. A queen bee lives many, many times more than a worker bee. And an even more extreme disparity is observed in ants. And here the queens were observed to live for over 30 years. And so this is pretty crazy because, I mean, insects living so long, we're more used to insects being just very short-lived. But here, an ant lives longer than some, probably most mammals. I mean, horses live for like up to 30 years, and here's an ant living 30 years. I mean, dogs and cats live half that. So this is pretty incredible. And here's example, another ant example that I really like because this shows epigenetics can actually reprogram an already formed individual. So it's, it's not just that happens in, initially that epigenetic determines the fate, but actually it could change the fate of in this case, an ant that switches its social role from a worker to a breeder. And this also greatly expands their lifespan. So I think that shows that even an adult organism can epigenetically modulate its lifespan, at least in case of ants. And also, this is an example I really like because previously you had different examples based on social roles. But here, this is an animal, modern butterfly, that does not have any different social roles. It has just one social role. Um, and the only reason that determines its lifespan is the season in which it is born in. So if it's, it's born in the spring, it lives for just one month. But if it's born in the fall, it has to overwinter. It lives, it lives for nine months. And there's actually species of mammals that exhibit a similar epigenetic control of lifespan. So these evolves, rodents, they can get also greatly extended lifespan if they're born in the fall rather than in the spring. And of course, most of the previous examples, they dealt with insects or rodents. And the most interesting question for us, what about humans? And while we don't have as clear examples of how epigenetics can control our aging, like in those insects, I think we have other observations that suggest that our aging also might be under epigenetic regulation. And of course, one such observation is the existence of epigenetic clocks in humans and many other mammals that we now know, like 182 mammalian species. And these clocks obviously tick with age in a very similar way in all of the same members of the same species. Like all of the humans of the same age show very similar epigenetic age, with of course, the difference in, in their life, life factors. And also, these epigenetic clocks seem to be very synchronized across many different cell types. So epigenetic age of a neuron is the same of, of my neuron, it is the same of my blood cell, despite the two cells being very different in their life histories. And another observation is, the, is that these epigenetic clocks tick slower in animals treated with no life-extending life interventions, like water restriction or rapamycin. So these epigenetic clocks do indeed seem to reflect aging, or aging speed, which I think adds credence to the hypothesis that in human aging, epigenetics also plays a key role. Okay, so it's great that aging is up under, or to some extent, under epigenetic control. So the next question is, epigenetics is reversible, so is aging potentially reversible? Can we expect rejuvenation to occur? Yeah, obviously, rejuvenation is, of course, occurs a lot in nature, but it seems to be reserved, at least in the case of mammals, it seems to be reserved for reproduction. And I think, in fact, without rejuvenation, reproduction would probably be impossible. As, I mean, human eggs, they age for 20 to 40 years before they get to develop into new babies. So I think rejuvena rejuvenation is a requirement for the long line of succession in nature and the germ germline that we observe. So obviously, yes, in nature, all sorts of rejuvenation happen after fertilization and in some other context, but whether we can repurpose it, that's still an open question. And well, for example, in yeast cells, which are a weird special case because they're single-celled organisms, they age when they replicate asexually. But whenever they're forced to reproduce sexually, their aging is reset and even an old cell 
can get fully rejuvenated by this gametogenesis process. And also some species have learned to kind of hack this reproduction process. And that's the way they are able to enjoy biological immortality by essentially turning themselves back into an embryo. And so this is how this immortal jellyfish Turritopsis does it. And there's another genus of jellyfish that is capable of that called Aurelia. Now, speaking of similar life hacks, life hacks that other species have invented, some species of beetle have developed an ability to go back in their development, kind of like jellyfish, but they're regressing back stages in their metamorphosis, metamorphosis if they detect adverse environmental conditions. And so using this trick, scientists have been able to extend their lifespan of these types of beetles by up to 10 times relative to what's usually observed in nature. And I touched upon this briefly about germ germline rejuvenation, and I just wanted to go it, into it a bit, a bit deeper because this is what actually brought me to partial reprogramming many years ago, the observation of the rejuvenation that happens in the germline cells. And I was very kind of pleasantly touched to hear yesterday that Insights from Germline Rejuvenation was the project that won this longevity prize hypothesis, because I was personally also fascinated by this topic many years ago. And so the, these are the next few slides are actually from my 2016 presentation that was called Rejuvenation Secrets from the Immortal Germline. And it's, it's actually quite fascinating that the germline is immortal and every single living thing on the planet right now, including all of us, can trace an unbreakable line of successful rejuvenation events all the way back like three and a half billion years ago to our common ancestor. And so of course the, the question is what powerful mechanisms enable this? And if germ cells can enjoy this rejuvenation, can we find ways to allow somatic cells to, to also do that? Oh yeah, and this is our common ancestry tree. We're here and it dates back all the way back three and a half billion years ago, which is just fascinating sometimes to just kind of meditate on it. Okay, so the, of course, the question, what's so special about the, the germline was asked for by many people, many years, for, for many decades. And I think the biggest question is, do germ cells have some kind of special treatment that they're able to escape aging, or maybe they dilute the damage they accumulate, or do they have an actual rejuvenation? process. And so I, I think the, the, well, at least the evidence I have collected shows that the germ cells actually do have an active rejuvenating program that they enjoy. And in this case, for the yeast study that was done by Angelica Amon's team by Elgin Unal in, in 2011, have, they've looked into this and they've came to the conclusion that there is no special protection in yeast are single cell organisms. So they're both kind of the somatic and, and germ cells. And uh, so there is active rejuvenation in yeast that happens during gametogenesis. That is the, the process of the transformation reserved for sexual reproduction in yeast. And it was observed that this gametogenesis process fully resets the age in yeast, replicative age in yeast. And it doesn't matter how old or young a cell was at this process, after the gametogenesis, they get the same kind of lease on life, same amount of ability to divide in the future that both, as I said, old or young, doesn't matter how old you were, you get reset to the same baseline. And also it was shown that any accumulated damage, or at least in this case, in the form of carbonylated proteins, is actively cleared in yeast by this gametogenesis process. And also it was shown that meiosis is not required for this active rejuvenation and age reset as even cells that were deficient for meiosis in which meiosis didn't happen, they still underwent this active rejuvenation if gametogenesis was induced in these cells. So in conclusion, the yeast observations argued against damage dilution and for active rejuvenation, at least in the study by Unal and colleagues. And going from yeast to mice, I mean, yeast were not the only organism in which, in which this was investigated. Mice and flies and nematodes, all, in all of these systems, it was shown that there is an active rejuvenation process that takes place in their egg cells after fertilization. So this is a study in mice. This is a study from uh, Cynthia Kenyon's team and nematodes. They also showed something similar. That actually, nematodes, it happens just before fertilization. 
And nematodes are hermaphrodites, so they, they actually fertilize themselves, so they know when they're going to fertilize themselves, so they can actually clear damage in their egg cells just before fertilization. In frogs, frog egg cells, it was also shown that this happens, this active rejuvenation after fertilization. And switching gears a little bit, looking from what happens from epigenetic standpoint after fertilization, has also yielded very interesting ob observations. And here's a paper from the Dimaglagians group, which has shown that epigenetic age is actually not immediately reset after fertilization, but it actually takes a takes some time and reaches a minimum during gastrulation, soon after implantation around like then day, day 10 in mice. And which again implies that there is an active rejuvenation process that takes place in fertilized eggs. All right, I think now it's time to give a brief historical overview of cellular reprogramming before tying it back to germline rejuvenation, which I plan on doing very shortly. All right, okay. Before reprogramming proved it wrong, the epigenetic dogma in biology was that cell fate determination was an irreversible process. Cells start from a stem cell state and then sort of roll down this Wellington landscape to their eventual cell fate, skin cell or brain cell. And this was formulated by Waddington in, in 1940. But just 20 years later, John Gurdon showed that this might not be true as he took a nucleus from a skin cell and put it in an egg cell and produced a completely healthy frog, which implied that the skin cell retains all the necessary DNA for all other cell types of an organism. And this reminds me of this giant leap between the first human in space in 1961 and the first reusable shuttle flight 20 years later, because unfortunately, just in space exploration, there was a 30-year pause in this area. And the next experimental confirmation of this possibility of epigenetic reprogramming came in 1996 with essentially the same repeat of the Gurdon experiment, just instead of frogs, they, they now use sheep. And this is the famous Dolly the sheep. And here she is meeting her creator. And the, uh, she, she died prematurely. So people thought maybe she actually was born old or, or, some, or some other things, but actually no, the, uh, after Dolly, they also cloned several other sheep here for other clones and they were, had perfectly normal lifespan. So. There's nothing wrong with somatic cell nuclear transfer or the cloning methodology. But back to reprogramming, the next breakthrough, which fully refuted the Waddington dogma, came in 2006 with Yamanaka and Takahashi, which showed that you can actually take any somatic cell and reprogram it back into embryonic like stem cell with the cocktail of their four OSCAM factors that have since been christened Yamanaka factors. And of course, they got a Nobel Prize together with John Gurdon in 2012, which means it took 50 years for John Gurdon to get recognition for his brilliant insight. And so after the Waddington dogma was refuted, the updated epigenetic landscape turned out to be essentially bidirectional. Cells can indeed move back all the way, all the way up to the embryonic-like stem cell, or they can move laterally if they are so induced. And of course, this discovery very soon sparked talk of the possibility of epigenetic rejuvenation, which for our purposes is the real holy grail in all of this. And the first mention of the term epigenetic rejuvenation that I found on PubMed belongs to Prince Singh, who pondered about this back in 2010. And then very soon it was confirmed in 2011 that indeed reprogrammed cells are rejuvenated by the reprogramming process. And the first indication of this came from Jean-Marc Lumetsko's team. And then many other teams also followed and saw different aspects of rejuvenation happening for different, different hallmarks. And this diagram kind of brings it all together. It shows that all of the cellular hallmarks are rejuvenated by the reprogramming process. And so, of course, the next question was, can we do this in vivo? And the first study to try this was in 2013, Manuel Serrano's group. Unfortunately, they were not successful as their mice died rather quickly after just two weeks of induction of Yamanaka factors. <clears throat> and so maybe that's why the title of their uh, paper is somewhat gloomy. Reprogramming in vivo produces teratomas and iPS cells with totipotency features. But and teratomas are, of course, like tumors, something that we don't really want, so we have to avoid them. 
the real breakthrough that showed that you can actually use reprogramming the Bevo came from Alejandro Campo and others from the Soul Group under the direction of Juan Carlos Tiso Belmonte. And their treatment showed that you can use in vivo reprogramming for prolonging lifespan in progeric mice by up to 50% and also showing multiple therapeutic benefits in the treated mice. In particular, I mean, just visually, the mice looked younger in the treatment group and the control group. And also, based on many biomarkers, they were younger. They had fewer senescent cells, fewer DNA breaks, lower levels of inflammation. Their blood vessels looked better. The histology of various tissues looked closer to the wild type than the control group, and et cetera. And so the question is, why did Ocampo et al. succeed where others might have failed with in vivo reprogramming? And the answer to that, I think the key insight was that reprogramming has to be partial. In vivo reprogramming has to be partial, meaning that you can only induce the amino acid factors for short bursts because that does not allow cells to climb the Waddington landscape too far, at least so far that they would ch change their identity. So by using partial reprogramming, you keep the cell identity unchanged. And of course, remember the tertomas in the Serrano group. This is something that we, we really need to avoid in reprogramming. And I mean, tertomas are not like awful, awful, because they're not metastatic. And but so they're not as people say, it's, it's, hear them and they say it's cancer, but it's, it's just a little less bad than cancer. But of course, we still want to avoid them. And the tertomas start forming when cells have been pushed too far in, in, by reprogramming and too far up the Waddington landscape. And so previously, before Camp at all, there have been indications in the literature that if you don't limit your reprogramming to short periods, you end up with teratomas, as shown in this paper here. But if you do limit OS chem expression to just a few days, then teratomas do not occur. So I think this was the key insight that Camp et al. have realized and reproduced in the paper and I think paved the way for the entire partial reprogramming field. And so, but at this point, the question is how exactly does partial reprogramming rejuvenate cells? And of course, the exact mechanisms of that are still unknown, but I think we have some general observations that can help us formulate some possible hypotheses. And the first question is what exactly are OSCAN factors? And what exactly do they do? And it's, it's been well known that these factors are responsible for maintaining stemness in embryonic stem cells, and also that they're pioneer transcription factors capable of accessing close chromatin and opening it up. But also, I think what is mentioned less often is that OCT4 and SOX2 are key factors in triggering maternal to zygotic transition during early embryogenesis in mammals. And this is when the maternal genome gets silenced and the embryo's own genome takes over. And this process starts in the blastula and finishes in the, in the gastrula after implantation. And so that Gladyshev group work about epigenetic age reaching a minimum after gastrulation. Well, I, I can't help but wonder if the two processes are somehow related. Maybe the rejuvenation that we see during reprogramming is carried out by kind of the same gene networks that get triggered during the maternal to zygotic transition. I mean, this is just conjecture at this point, but I, I think there might be something to it. And, okay, now switching gears from what could be happening to what we're actually observing. I mean, what we know that partial reprogramming rejuvenates the transcriptome across multiple tissues, as this paper has shown. And again, while the exact mechanism might, might be clear, these observations are compelling enough to try to take advantage of them therapeutically, at least from my practical mindset, the drug developer. And here's another study that showed that partial reprogramming rejuvenates gene expression and brings it closer to useful levels. And yet another study has shown that partial reprogramming not only rejuvenates gene expression, but also physiologically rejuvenates various tissues, which again, from a practical standpoint, I think it's compelling enough to try to create partial reprogramming therapies, which by now there's a dozen companies trying to do that. And so now why rejuvenation via partial reprogrammation is at all possible is because thankfully the reprogramming process is gradual. And so the epigenetic age, this blue line, is reduced gradually before the cell loses its functional identity as the two graphs on the bottom show. And so potentially we can recouple, we can decouple rejuvenation from the differentiation and find the safe therapeutic window as shown here in which the biological age is already reduced this blue line is already reduced, 
but the functional identity of the cell it still remains. So these, for example, in the case of fibroblasts, these gene clusters that are responsible for keeping it a fibroblast still remain at decent expression levels. And so the implications of this for our therapeutic purposes, I think, are quite profound. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, the biggest process, the biggest problem with aging is that the increase in our mortality risk is an exponential process. And so it, here, the graph of mortality risk, we're usually used to seeing it in this logarithmic projection. But if you look at it from a linear projection, it just skyrockets after a particular age. And thankfully, our chances of dying are not that high, even at age 60. So it's still annual risk of dying is one in 100. So if we can actually find ways to slow down the exponential decline, the exponential nature, the exponential increase in the mortality risk, I think we can greatly expand our lifespan. So the hypothesis is that by periodically using partial reprogramming to bring back the uh, epigenetic age like to a lower level and doing this in a repeated way, maybe we can actually prevent the, or at least slow down or we change the exponent in the exponential increase of the mortality risk. And of course, that's the ultimate goal. Ultimate goal is to, to prevent the exponential decline. We're definitely not there yet, unfortunately, but I think there have been kind of baby steps in that direction since the 2016 account at all paper. And next, I'd like to show you several more results that I think are particularly compelling. One study by, again, Hajan Wakumeto's group was showing that even a single bout of voice scan administration early in life can prolong lifespan. And it actually showed this in both progeric and non-progeric mice. So this was an interesting result. And while it's not a huge increase, I think it's, the, again, compelling enough as a starting point, as a proof of concept for us to keep exploring this paradigm. This is a study of David, from David Sinclair's group that showed that the partial reprogramming using just three other factors, OSK and reprogram neuronal regenera regeneration, promote neuronal regeneration, and even restore vision in, in, in mice. And this study that showed the, that partial reprogramming can improve muscle rejuvenation, regeneration after injury. And again, from a therapeutic standpoint, this is already something compelling for us to start creating therapies against ex existing diseases while also keeping our eye on kind of the, the main goal of creating combination therapies that could eventually allow us to slow down aging or maybe even stopping or even reversing. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. And this is another study that showed that using partial reprogramming, you can greatly improve wound healing in a mouse model. And another study showed that you can use partial reprogramming to slow down spinal degeneration. Also, the Belmonte group showed the safety of long-term partial reprogramming because some of the skeptics said that reprogramming is so dangerous that if you, if you do it frequently enough for a long enough duration, you're bound, you're bound to have some side effects. But here, the Belmonte group showed that even 10 months of consecutive induction of reprogramming is safe enough, and it still produces therapeutic benefits. And of course, initially in 2016, in Ocampo et al., the Belmonte group showed that even 35 weeks of consecutive OSK induction is safe in wild-type mice. But then they followed up with this paper showing that 10 months of treatment are still safe and also resulting in various therapeutic benefits as on, shown on the figures here. Okay, finally, we're getting pretty close to time. So I just want to highlight some important recent results and outline the future directions for partial reprogramming. And a lot of people who've been watching this space have been particularly anxious to see if partial reprogramming can extend lifespan in wild-type mice, non-progeric, non-fast-aging mice. And just recently, Rejuvenate Bio reported that they've been able to extend lifespan in very old wild-type mice, and they've been able to do that using a gene therapy approach, using just three factors, OSK factors, as in David Sinclair's work. And while the increase has been kind of modest, but I think, again, this is an important proof of principle showing that we can do this, we can achieve this even by gene therapy approach. So it's not a transgenic mouse model in which the OSK factors were present since birth. It's actually normal animals like you and I to which these genes were added by gene therapy approach. And also there, there's a very interesting recent paper that showed that OCT4 alone might be enough to prolong lifespan in progeric mice. And this is surprising because as far as I know, OCT4 in vitro was not enough to produce significant rejuvenation 
as reported by several groups, in particular Jacob Kimmel's group from Calico, they, they studied single factors. But who knows, maybe in vivo for is enough. And also, this wasn't partially programmed per se, because it was just activating endogenous OCT4 using Cas9 fused with the activator. And so this was a single injection they did, which caused gene expression to persist for up to two weeks. And so they just did two injections into these mice. And also, it was surprising that they, they, they say that 50% of cells in the aorta were shown to be transduced by, by, by their approach. So I'm wondering how many cells in the liver also showed were targeted by their vector. Okay, but back to partial reprogramming. I think a key insight that many people in the field have come to is that partial reprogramming really needs to be tissue specific. In fact, some tissues just need to be avoided altogether. And here's data, recent data from the Kemper group showing that the two key organs to avoid are the liver and the intestine. Because if you don't avoid them, just might start dying just after four days of consecutive OSK and induction. But if you do avoid them, you can expand the therapeutic window of reprogramming to up to 10 days where all the mice still survive. And even after 30 days, half of the mice survive consecutive days of OSK and induction. So I think this is important, an important result. And so I think the future of partial reprogramming will be tissue specific and cell type specific. And so with that in mind, okay, Josh joining the future direction of for reprogramming, at least from our standpoint at youth bio, is as follows. These are the things that we're exploring, and I'm sure others in the field also are exploring them, looking for novel factors that are safer than immunaka factors, because immunaka factors were never designed for partial reprogramming. They were designed to fully reprogram cells. And so right now the search is for factors that are still rejuvenating, but not as powerful as immunaka factors and also possibly to look for cell type specific rejuvenating factors and eventually come up with cell type specific cocktails that are tailored towards the, the, the cell type that you're targeting. And also because of that, you need cell type specific delivery mechanisms. I mean, you can still use general delivery and target cell, cell type specificity and get cell type specificity, specificity using cell type specific promoters. But ideally, you also want to have delivery mechanisms that only target the cell types that you want and don't end up in organs and tissues that you don't. That said, the current focus is on organ-specific therapies right now that we're able to create therapies for existing diseases. And in the future, of course, the goal is to create combination therapies that can prevent diseases and hopefully rejuvenate systemically the organism. And also we're looking for gene circuits that can incorporate safety logic into the vectors to monitor if we, for some reason, have pushed the cell too far into the reprogramming direction and whether we can bring it back to its original cell types. And ideally, we would also like to find ways for durable and long-lasting reprogramming where we don't have to do this periodically, but maybe we can shift the gene expression pattern and kind of let it stay there. Rather than right now, once you stop the inducing the reprogramming factors, the gene expression relapses back to the baseline. So if we can find ways to keep it at rejuvenated level for longer, I think this is also an important open question in this space. With that, I'm done with my 40 minutes. If you have any questions, i would be happy to answer them right now. So if you have any questions, just feel free to ask them or... I'll ask a question. And there are questions in the chat as well. So see the chat. who wants to do that? Why don't you start, Kriyan, and then we go down the list. And so I give a little bit more folk, a time for folks to also upload some questions. Okay, fine. So the is there... This is a big question. Is it known... Okay, first question. Is the... Epigenetic control of the rejuvenation versus de-differentiation. Is it the same rough type of control? Is it all is it all methylation or is it more complicated with like dynamics of, of RNA and and post-translational stuff? Or is it all just DNA methylation that is controlling differentiation, the de-differentiation, the rejuvenation, and you have to just get the specific methyl groups swapped in or out or is there more going on that where you have to reach in and change downstream metabolics as well 
Yeah, I'm sure it, it's much more than just methylation. I think mes- methylation is somewhat of a like secondary mechanism or a fail-safe me- mechanism. Probably the, the primary mechanism is like histone, epigenetic mechanisms where things are silent and compacted and, and put into uh, silence chromatin. So to change cell identity, yes, I think the pioneer factors actually open all of the SKM factors. The OCT4 and SOX2 open up the chromatin and they start like a, a massive change in gene expression pattern. So if we're talking about gene, exp- gene identity changes and methylation is kind of, I think it's a secondary mechanism or an auxiliary mechanism to like more fine tuned control of gene expression. So methylation itself, yeah, I think it, it, it's not enough to, to, to change cell identity. And so do these Yamanaka factors last, and then I'll start up, do these Yamanaka factors or these related therapeutics, they enter the nucleus and all the action happens in the nucleus? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Transcription factors. Yeah. But they, once they're synthesized, and they, they, they're transported back to the nucleus where they actually bind to DNA and to, you know, go to their binding sites and then start remodeling chromatin and activating gene expression or suppressing gene expression and also triggering expression of downstream transcription factors that kind of feed this thing, the, the cycle or a feedback loop of you know, changing cell identity. Cool. Okay. We still have a few more questions to go. We have Aram, then Andy, and then Vadim. Yes. Hi. Actually, my name is A. Dot Ramo. So I don't know why the O was last. So I don't know how to recover that anyway. So my question is to Yuri, and actually this is a nice scan over over this different system of aging and it reinforces certain ideas I have had in the past. So my first question is, what's the effect on the brain and of this rejuvenation, especially with regard to memory and uh, some established tests that animals and human, of course, go under. Some of that is epigenetically also controlled. So how would then rejuvenation affect the brain cells? Yeah, it's definitely interesting, open question. And th- there was a study by Manuel Serrano's group that investigated reprogramming in the brain. They reported as I- improvement, modest improvement in memory. I don't think they've reported any negative effects. Also, I mean, we're looking at the brain at Youth Bio and we haven't seen negative effects, but of course, I think, yeah, we're, we're still in the early stages of, of reprogramming and, and I, in some aspects of it are really hard to determine. We can't really talk to the mice and, and make sure they still remember everything. We can just yeah. do like some studies where they remember cues yeah. to in their mazes. So there are definitely some things to explore and there's, yeah, absolutely a hypothesis that memories could be actually encoded. It's still a hypothesis, but uh, it's still definitely an important aspect. Uh, yeah. And the patient. other question, yeah, the other question is. Uh, why sorry, we will stick with one question. So we make sure that we go to everyone and then we come back to you. Is that okay? No, that's a new policy, I guess. Okay. Thank it you. It is a new policy. We have so many questions this time. Andy, right. you're next. Yeah. Great presentation, Mary. I was wondering with your approach to reprogramming are you following like genetic manipulation or are you looking at small molecules that can adjust these factors do you actually have something better than oskm now that you're starting to target and where are you on your development we hope we have something better we'll we'll definitely see we, we have some candidates that we've bioinformatically that we think could be better we're still like we have to verify them we're, we're working actively to verify in vitro that they could be better and yeah we, we're just using gene therapies, not small molecules. Is just, I think, one less layer to remove to tinker with. I mean, I, I, if we identify the, the best genes to do this job, and then then we can maybe look into small molecules that can induce it. But of course, small molecules are so promiscuous that it's very hard to to find something that just targets like this gene, and then a lot of the genes that doesn't have any off target effects. And it, 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 in, I mean, yes, small molecule reprogramming, co- chemical reprogramming has been also a very interesting topic that at some point people have reported success, others can replicate success. And then some, some people still replicate it, but it requires like a cocktail of seven different molecules, none of which you would be comfortable putting in your body. So 
short answer is we just stick with gene therapies. And if eventually somebody can find small molecules, so that definitely be better because of course, you know, gene therapies are hard to deliver, but for now we're just sticking with the gene therapy approach. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Next one up, we have Fadim. Thank you, Alison. Um, thank you, Yuri, for the nice overview. Uh, so, uh, your, in your screen, you, you made a comment. Crazy, and now I have no screen at all for the Zoom. Okay, so my question uh, yeah, when you used East as an example, you posed a question whether mm, this gametogenesis in East is rejuvenation or damage dilution. To me, what happens during a gametogenesis in, in the East is the gametes, they are synthesized within the cell, and once the membrane barrier is formed, you basically exclude the damage uh, from the mother cell, and therefore it is a classical example of damage dilution. So my, my question is whether you know of any examples of in rejuvenation, like epigenetic re rejuvenation, as, as you discussed, where the damage dilution would not be a factor, where cells, will, for example, would not divide, there would be some other mechanisms that would allow mm, damage dilution. So is it possible in your mind to rejuvenate cells without diluting damage or removing it? Yeah, I, I think we debated this <laughs> over email many years ago, where I think that one example is in, in the meiosis deficient yeast cells, where the, the meiosis, they disabled meiosis, they actually don't divide into four different cells. It, it, it remains a single cell, if I remember correctly. So there's no di nothing to di like no dilution happening uh, are you talking about just a simple budding the the, the budding of yeast? then of course it's dilution as well because you form a barrier between the mother cell and daughter cell the same right but i think they reported in, in the null paper if if you in myosis deficient cells if you induce gametogenesis the rejuvenation happens before of the the actual body of the daughter cell so and I, I'd have to review, of course, yeah, in, in multicellular organisms, you get massive cell division from one to a trillion. So it's hard to, to rule out some aspect of dilution. But I, I think in, in some studies, like in mice, for example, with the Mullen-Hernigring studies, they, they showed that there is actual clearance of within particular cells, there's actual clearance of some of the damage, like the carbonylated proteins. But of course, yeah, ruling out di dilution, and and I've I've quoted the papers in which they try to make a case for ruling out, but that dilution is not, the, the, at least not the primary mechanism, there actual is active damage clearance, which they make this assumption, the inference from their observations, so. Thank you. Next one up, we yes. have Michael who posted this question in the chat. Yeah, hi, Michael. Should I read out the question? Do you want to go for it? Sure. Uh, sorry, sure. I hit the wrong button. You mentioned that the Yamanaka Yama vectors trigger downstream factors, which then do more reprogramming work. Do we have all that mapped out, what the series of factors that are expressed along the way? And if so, is there a particular factor, set of factors that show up just before the differentiation starts? It's a great question. I mean, there's definitely data sets, like a time series of gene expression changes for reprogramming data sets, both human and mouse data. And yeah, you can, they're so massive. There's hundreds of thousands of genes that change their expression levels and figuring out like the, the causal inferences which are actually right. might cause the differentiation from which are like just passive right. passengers in the process and it, it's hard but the, the data exists and i think a lot of people including ourselves are trying to mine the data to to like trying to extract the <laughs> rejuvenating aspects of reprogramming before kind of the, the differentiating aspects of reprogramming so, and... thanks you're getting a thumbs up Jason, you're next. Thank you. Thanks, Yuri. Very well done. Uh, just, had a, yeah, just had a question. I see this area of cellular reprogramming, this broad area of research as sort of a unique, takes a unique place in aging research. 
So I was just wondering your perspective, like given the extensive capital, the amount of companies and people involved and how much R&D is involved, how much sharing of kind of that, those discoveries are, are being done in relation to other like biotech firms or just aging in general? You're mentioning like different papers. I mean, is there more sharing happening given the kind of technical complexity of how to actually get it done in a human? Or do you feel like it's just kind of the normal that we always see in business? Or I'm just, just curious on your perspective. Yeah, I think there's a little more of transparency and openness and just camaraderie in, in the longevity field than in so traditional biotech, because I think most people in the longevity field are like mission driven. They, they like to see everybody succeed. So even if they might be officially competitors, they still like to encourage and, and share knowledge and promote um, the work or help the work of other groups that could be ultimately will all will benefit from it, right? So I think there's a little more openness and, and definitely in, in the conferences where a lot of groups share pre-publication data, like the GRC conferences last year, which was excellent. So the, I think there's a lot of desire to share results that could help other groups or could lead to insights by other groups. And so that eventually we all figure out be it reprogramming and some, some other paradigms, how to make them translatable and produce meaningful therapeutic results or, or the coveted lifespan extension that we're all seeking. So I think I, I would say that the longevity field is a little better than other fields. So, you know, of course, I don't have the lay of all of the biotech subfields, but it's just kind of my, my personal intuition. I think that's a great segue into me asking the obligatory question of if this group wants to help you and your work succeed, what can they do? A, how can they find more out about your work? And B, like really specifically, like what's kind of holding progress back for you right now and what could people do to help? Well, yeah, I think if, if we succeed and everybody else in the field succeeds in partial reprogramming, we're going to see some great therapies against existing diseases that uh, could could be, you know, changing the standard of care for those diseases. I mean, for us, if you buy, we're pretty traditional biotech right now, early stage biotech. So I think like everybody else, the funding is, is the biggest limiting factor for us. So we're actually fundraising and if somebody actually wants to help us, this would be the biggest help for in helping us fundraise. Uh, other than that, we'll be collaborative and also looking for collaborations, open to collaborations with uh, existing labs. So if there's something that you think we can potentially work together on, or well, feel free to reach out and we'd love to chat about it. Maybe from that awesome. list of future directions, something you, you saw that, you know, of interest. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Yuri. I, this is again a great segue for me to welcome you all and to next week's longevity workshop. Many people on this call will be joining there, you too, Yuri. So I think I'm really, really excited to see many of you in person so, so soon. Just again, a reminder, like, well, there, there aren't any spots anymore for the longevity workshop at this moment, but if you're on this list, which many of you guys are, then we'll be meeting on Monday sharp to kick off the workshop. So I'm very, very excited to see many of you there. Please let me know in case you have any questions about this, but this is just a funny reminder because we're having lots of people now joining. And so I just do want to make sure that everyone is ready for the workshop. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Yuri. This was really wonderful. Thanks everyone else for joining. And yeah, I'm excited to see many of you either next week in person or virtually again very soon thereafter. All right. Bye-bye everyone and see you soon.